Right, we're going to give a little, uh, bit more of the summary, summary of this report because in this report there are some really helpful insights that will help us uh, make decisions about how we do the children's and youth work that we do. Um, and it's, it's revealed some really interesting points along the way. One of them is, and I haven't quite realised this but it makes sense, that decline is not just in the church, there's actually been a big drop in social connectedness. So other clubs, other sort of membership clubs and things like that are on the decline. We often think that the church is the only thing that's declining, but actually all kinds of other social connectedness groups are in decline across the country. And there's also a decline in the sense of trust in other people and in institutions. That's been said for a good number of years now, I think. Uh, but it's also true. So people come to the church with a, with a good deal of suspicion and, and lack of trust. Whereas maybe the church historically had this place of authority. And people thought the church spoke the truth and was the truth, and is the truth, but now people are much quicker to question that. Um, there is a faith difference, obviously, that we can offer. Young adults who state that Christianity is important to them show higher levels of participation in belonging to a club or a group than those who do not, which again I thought was quite interesting. So people who are Christians, will engage in other things more as well. So I don't know if that's true of you, that as a Christian, you actually have other interests and engagements, whereas maybe people who aren't so connected to faith don't have so many other connections either. And it'll be true of our young people and children as well. You see a lot of our young people withdraw into themselves and have very little contact with anything apart from through an internet or a game, social media. But if we do have children and young people in our churches, they are the ones who are more likely to be connected to other interest groups and social groups as well, which is a good thing. So the real problem. Young people are not necessarily losing their faith in Jesus, but they are losing their faith in the church. Where else do they go? This is possibly one of the saddest results of this survey, of this research. That it's actually the church that is letting people down. It's the church that is the barrier to young people finding Jesus and growing in faith. And that's a heartbreaker right there. Are we the ones who are actually stopping children and young people growing in their faith because we represent the church that doesn't connect with them. I hope that's not true for any of us. But some of our churches do a really good job at saying to children and young people, you don't belong. And so they don't necessarily lose faith in Jesus, but they lose faith in church which then in turn leads them away because they don't have them a faith community to grow. So that, that's a real kick in the gut, that one. <clears throat> uh, so how can we uh, do something? What can we do? So again, the report suggests that these really fundamental things, and some of these were on your lists as well at the beginning of our evening, these are fundamentals to get right. If we're going to be a church that welcomes, loves, includes, values children and young people, then these are five absolutely non-negotiables. And you might think, well, I wonder how we would score as a church if we were going to mark ourselves out of ten against these five things. Listen more. Are we a listening church? Are we a listening group of leaders? Do we listen to children and young people? Or do we simply teach and give out instructions and learning? Do we listen? Are we actually quite friendly or are we distant? 
Do we actually want to walk with our children and our young people, or do we just want to tell them how to live? Are we friendly? Are we non-judgmental? A crucial one uh, in the research, especially for young people, as you can imagine. Young people are exploring uh, their own identity, often through uh, puberty, wondering who I am, wondering what will happen if I say this or say that. That's why teenage years are always so difficult in the family, because young people are trying things out, pushing the boundaries, exploring who they want to be. Are we as a church saying you shouldn't be doing that, stop doing that, you shouldn't be looking like that when you come to church, you shouldn't be behaving like that when you come to church, or are we actually... They're young, they need this space, that's what we talked about earlier, space. Are we actually loving, tolerant to a certain degree, and accepting of who they are? Be passionate. Uh, I'm always challenged by this. Sometimes you go to churches and you just think, oh my goodness, if the preacher just would actually believe what they said, it might come across with a bit of energy. Um, and it's the same for us, isn't it? Sometimes we can get tired and we get stuck in a, a routine and it just, you know, we just have to do this and just have to do that and we lose our passion. So it's hugely important for us as leaders to keep ourselves alive, to keep ourselves diving deep into who God is and who he uh, is for us and his love for us. So let's remind ourselves to be passionate in what we're doing. Because if we're not, then there's no chance that any passion will transfer to the children and the young people that we work with. I used to have a saying that I told my leaders um, in, in a previous job. If you want your children and young people to be sparks for Jesus, then you have to be a fire. So, be a fire. Be a passionate fire. Um, and be social. It's not just about church services. I know some of the conversations on tables were getting stuck on services and what we do on a Sunday morning. Of course, church is a bigger expression of who we are as, as, as Christians. So how are we being social with children and young people and adults, the older generations? How can we be social? How can we produce social spaces so relationships can form across the ages? Dare you try doing some church socials that will actually appeal to all ages and everyone can get involved. Those are some of the most wonderful moments of being church together and we don't even sing a hymn. <sighs> so can we be social? All right, so those five things, the research suggests work on these things and you'll see, hopefully, more children and young people taking root in your church if these five things um, are important to you. Any suggestions? I was going to have table time now, but I don't think we've got time to have a big chat. But any, any suggestions that you just want to shout out about how any of those five could happen at your place? What kind of ideas, what kind of things might need to change or that you could do? Any thoughts? So a film night that everyone is invited to. So is this under the social heading? But it could be also friendly. Um, you could be very passionate about letting go. Um, so, so yes, great. So church socials, actually plan your socials with children in mind. Is it so late that most of them won't be able to come because they'll be in bed? You know, what can you do at a time which is accessible to people of all ages? Good one. Any other suggestions? Non-judgmental. Uh, it's really, really hard for us to have intuitive on our foreign on youth group. We don't tell them what we're swearing. We just, just, I mean, some of them, some of them, they'll just do it next to you. But over the years, it's obviously that some of them have stopped doing it around us, stopped doing it in church because they've noticed that we don't do it, and therefore, like, okay, why? And that's brought some conversations because people have always said, "Why don't you tell them what we're swearing?" 
So I don't need to go to the computer to do that. <laughs> and there's a conversation about it. That always feels like us in the back. <laughs> so don't tell kids off for swearing in, in dance setting where some of the kids might not come from uh, nice, well mannered, well, well behaved, well spoken uh, families and you might see some more colourful language. But the effect of constantly saying, don't swear, you mustn't swear, you mustn't swear, what does that tell? the child actually, you don't like the way I speak, you don't like what I have to say, you don't like me, I'm out of here. So there are give and takes, there are tolerances that can buy you relationship and is the relationship more important than the behaviour? That's a big one. Ooh, because some of us don't like the bad behaviour, no, nope. we don't do that, oh no, you do that, you're out. But at what cost? Is that, does that happen? Do we lose relationship if we hold fast to the rules and the what's acceptable in our place? And it's, and on the, uh, the being passionate one, I feel like, certainly for me, I feel like we're oh, tempted to like, burn ourselves out as we use the children's work because they just like, not look after our own first or maybe for you. So I think sometimes if we focus on that first, then our passion for them becomes effective for the young people as well. I think that's what we were so busy doing things for them that actually our own passion is waning and we don't look after ourselves. Yeah, really important to look after yourselves. And I know for myself there have been times and often long times in my life where I'm not looking after myself. And those are always to the detriment of myself, my family, my church, anyone. And then I somehow get a nudge, sometimes from my wife, saying, what are you doing, Mike? You know, are you still investing your time? Are you digging deep? And I have to say, it's so hard because Caden's up at six o'clock and I can't get up any earlier than that and I'm shattered and I'm too worked. And, but we have, you know, we've got to sort of address some of the most important fundamental issues about our own spiritual health. And I've just finished reading two Chronicles. Anyone else just getting through the hard book in the Bible? <laughs> Although Josiah comes at the end and he's quite good. And then there's a few that tail off at the end. And he was evil and he was evil and he was evil. And he was evil. Oh, great. <laughs> good morning, family, as I emerge from the bedroom. <laughs> and I've just been reading about Hezekiah. Wow. I feel vibrant and alive. <laughs> no. I want to Ezra next. I'm hopeful that <laughs> it's, not, it's not much of an improvement, is it, Ezra? Uh, okay, right. So be passionate and look after yourself. Okay, we'll move on. But keep those thoughts written down or alive in your own mind. Um, bread and wine comes up uh, in this report as well, as you can imagine. And the question is, what does inclusion mean if you are not permitted to take communion with everybody else? Communion before confirmation, question mark. I was just having a conversation uh, with Ian Scott, oh, who's floating around with scouts outside. Um, this is sometimes a big issue uh, for churches. Uh, if you're a church that uh, welcomes this step, uh, that uh, is allowed in the Anglican way, if you have permission to work with uh, children who have been baptised but maybe haven't been confirmed, maybe they're not. Uh, old enough to think and really grapple with what confirmation means but they have a living faith and they're incorrigible and they're wanting to uh, join in with the Lord's Supper um, and that's something that our churches uh, can do and again if you want to talk to me about that at some point if your church uh, is, is struggling or grappling with that um, we can talk about it. Um, but it's a really important uh, thing. Uh, we've just uh, moved churches recently from a church that would give chocolate buttons to children, which of course is not allowed by any archdeacon's permission. Uh, however, chocolate buttons were given out to the children who didn't take communion. And we've started to go to a church uh, where chocolate buttons aren't part of the normal. Uh, and so my three-year-old, nearly four-year-old, is struggling with this a lot because he is used to having a chocolate treat, so now when we go up to the communion rail we have to take a little snack with us <laughs> in our back pocket, but he doesn't want that, he wants what's on the little silver plate holding above his head and it's his mission in life to knock them flying <laughs> out of the vicar's hand I'm sure at some point. Um, but joking aside, that's an issue for us as a family because 
he wants to, yes he's being a bit of a naughty boy because he's wanting just to disrupt, but why is he being naughty? Because he wants to be a part of what's happening, he wants something from there and he's not happy just with a prayer at the moment but we're working on that. But these are issues in our churches that can create challenges and questions uh, that we might not be asking ourselves but others who come to the communion rail might be asking. So let's find out what the issues are um, and sort of present them to church leadership and get them talked about. How can we nurture meaningful relationships between all church members? I feel we've touched on this a little bit, haven't we? It's not necessarily just an all-age service. We're not going to start uh, going through a whole all-age service uh, session right now. Um, I'm a big fan of all-age worship. It takes a lot of effort, doesn't it? It's, it's hard work, but that doesn't mean it's wrong to do. It just means that maybe it doesn't happen every week, but as much as we can uh, celebrate together uh, and involve all ages together, uh, that's, a, that's definitely a good thing. Uh, but it doesn't just have to be a Sunday morning conversation, as we've just said, where are the socials and where are the other parts of our church life where all ages can actually mix and chat and mingle together important things, generational, intergenerational. Um, here's a question, what does your PCC say about your church? Not what do they say verbally, but who makes up your PCC? Try and picture some of them in your mind. What age? What gender? What kind of sphere of life are they in? And do they reflect the church that you want to see on a Sunday morning? That's a loaded question, isn't it? Because I want you to say what it doesn't. But it might do in some of your churches. But there's a, there's a challenge there that sometimes our PCCs are full of people who won't let go of those roles. And they've been in the PCC for years and years and years. Um, and they don't want to let go. But the cost of that is that there's maybe less younger representation coming in to church leadership and church discussions. Uh, lots of churches find it really helpful to invite some younger people, some sort of 16, 17 year olds, as visitors, co-opted into PCC if you like. They can't vote because they're not old enough, but they can be part of conversations. Um, and that again uh, might tip the balance a little bit in a PCC meeting. It's amazing what the presence, even just the presence of a young person can do to a PCC meeting. Because it stops people being nasty to each other, which sometimes we're good at in PCC meetings, because it's almost like, oh, shouldn't uh, get into an argument, because uh, one of the young people are here, and I know her mother. <laughs> um, do you know what, so sometimes it's, a, it's an accountability thing, great, and it can change the tone of a PCC meeting. Um, but do, if, if it's right to, challenge the makeup of your PCC and say, look, everyone on our PCC is over this particular age, and if we're wanting to welcome and encourage younger families and younger people, how can we show that in our church leadership? How can we represent who we want to see coming to our church in our church leadership? The next point that the report makes is reaching out wider than our own church walls. How does your church connect in local and global mission? And you might think, what's that got to do with young people and children? It's got everything to do with young people and children. It's so important for our churches to be looking out, to be listening to God, saying, what do you want us to do as a church? What is your mission for us as a church? How do we reach out to our community? What is our role that we can play in uh, issues around the world? And include the children and the young people in those conversations. Don't just choose who you're going to give to as a church in a PCC without hearing what the passions and the interests and the concerns of the children are, because they will have concerns and interests as well. As a family, one of the things we try and do in our own home is have a, a little family gift day once a month, where we have uh, 15 pounds that we say, right, we're going to give but it'll be to whoever the children want to give it to. So we might, as parents, present, you know, we've had a few things through the post this week, you know, this is happening in this part of the country, or at church they talked about this, um, or is there something at school that you've heard about, or other things, you know, and they take it in turns each month. 
to decide where our bit of family giving goes. So they're in charge of it. Um, and we do it there and then on the laptop if it's like to water aid or something. So we send the money off. Um, and, but we can do that church-wise as well. Involve the children and the young people in thinking about how the church gives, how it engages in mission, uh, and uh, locally and globally. Church, not school. We've said this for many years, I think. I'm sure we're all part, past this point. I hope we are. But church is more than teaching, yes? Obvious point to make of the evening? Yes, please say yes. Nobody said yes, please say yes. Church is so much more than just teaching and therefore our children's groups and our youth groups are so much more than teaching. We're not just there to teach, we're there to walk with and we're there to love, we're there to demonstrate Jesus' kingdom uh, around the church family. It's so much more than teaching. Uh, on your tables, there's a little sheet, an A4 sheet that says, Rate Your Church. Very quickly, if you are prepared to be brave, go down this list of words and put a cross on the line where you think your church rates. So, for instance, the top one says relationships on one side and teaching on the other side. Does your church value relationships more than teaching? If so, you'd put your cross towards the word relationships. If you think you're more about teaching than relationships, then maybe you'd put your cross further down the line. We're not going to ha ta hand these in. We're not going to take them back to your churches and say, oh, look what Margaret says. She doesn't think we're very good on relationships. <coughs> it's just for you to have a think. Go through those. Some of those you might think, well, I don't know, right in the middle, they're not really opposites. They might not be opposites. But just give yourself a chance to go down that list and put a cross where you think your church values one thing over the other. My thought behind those words, and they were just kind of off the top of my head, I thought, well, let's just throw some things down there that will get us to think. Uh, you might think, well, actually, that's raised some interesting thoughts for me, and it would be a good thing for the PCC to actually start making some sort of assessments about where, as a church, you think you stand. You might find that people have different opinions. You might think, well, actually, there's a certain percentage of your PCC who would say, actually, the church is about teaching. If we're not teaching, then we're not a church. <coughs> Which, of course, may or may not be true. But at what cost to relationships uh, is that? Um, so have a little uh, think about that. Take that back into your teams if it's a helpful thing to, to use. Uh, challenge your PCCs, challenge your church leaderships uh, with your own assessment of your church uh, if you want to. There's a couple more points I want to raise and then we're going to have another little chat around tables. Transitions. Now this again is a, uh, a challenging bit of this report, I think, because it says sometimes young people need to drift, leave and return. I mean you could stop there and discuss that for an hour, couldn't you? Or maybe you couldn't. I think I could. Because theologically I kind of have a problem with that, but actually, realistically, young people, a lot of young people, do seem to need to have a drifting time. You might say that's the challenging questioning time of development, where they think, actually, I'm not sure I believe anymore. I'm going to stand over here because I don't know if I believe what you believe over there. I have lots of questions. I have big questions in my head. Not sure about that. I don't, want, I don't want to call myself a Christian for a bit, if that's all right, because I'm just exploring who I am and what I am. And you might think, oh, yikes, we've lost them. We've lost them. They're gone. How much do we think about in our churches about how they might return if they want to? Or if they come over here, are we almost over here folding our arms and saying, well, you, just, you, you went, you decided to go, and we turn our back, and it becomes impossible for the young person, maybe at the point when they want to have more conversation and dialogue over there, they think, oh, well, I've left now. 
I can't go back there now or else I'll, that's a bit embarrassing because then I have to kind of admit that I wanted to be back over there. How hard do we make it for young people to return if they want to? So have a think about how you can make a change. Chris? Well, the Amish people actually recognise that. They have something they call the run around years. That they recognise that the young people will need to do this. Sorry. Um, I was just saying that I've heard, heard um, that the Amish people, who, who are very devout and, and have quite strict upbringings, their children nevertheless rec recognise that they need this space as adolescents. And there is something that's called the runaround years. Um, and, and so maybe if we make it clear to young people that we almost expect this of them, then perhaps the coming back in won't be so difficult. Okay. The other question, of course, is how can we create spaces, youth spaces, where all that wandering about can happen in the church family? Do people have to go? Some of them will anyway, you might not be able to stop that, so how easy is it for them to come back? But what about the young people who don't go because possibly they think, oh I can't go, I can't go because my parents won't, won't let me do that, you know, or I couldn't give it up. You know, I have loads of questions but I couldn't give it up. So are we creating the spaces for young people effectively to drift, even in our youth groups, but keep relationship there, keep love, welcome, interaction, even though faith might feel like it's slipping or drifting. So pass on faith as a resource, not as an academic subject. So that's my bit on teaching again, really. You can't, well, you can teach faith to a certain degree, um, but you can't get faith unless it's experienced, unless somebody will walk with you and share faith with you. And faith grows in relationships. I think it's very hard, I'm just making this thought up on the spot really, I think it's very hard for faith to grow on your own. Would that be right? Does that sound right to you? If you were cut off from anybody, I know some people do cut themselves off and live a, a kind of faith development, but there's a challenge in my head that says actually for faith to grow you need to bounce, you need to relate, you need to love, you need to grow together. Um, so, anyway, a few, few thoughts on the transition. Um, so, around your tables, again, and for the final time tonight, uh, I encourage you to ask uh, this question. What ideas or challenges will you take back? There's been a lot covered tonight. It's been a bit different from our normal uh, network gatherings because I didn't want to just keep doing the same thing. But I hope it's been helpful uh, and important for you in the conversation. So look back on the things you wrote on your original piece of paper, look at your Rate the Church stuff, and think to yourselves, and have a chat around tables if you like, what ideas or challenges will you take back to your teams, to your church leaderships, what are you going to do next? Have a, have a few minutes to chew that over.